section, I'm entitling it basically Genetics 101. It's kind of like a review of your high school biology class, but on the other hand, we kind of need to start kind of at the basics of genetics and also where we can relate it to the sheep and goats and where we can relate it kind of to what we're going to be talking about in the next um, webinars. Because the whole idea is breeding better sheep and goats. And that's a really kind of funny or very generic topic because what does that mean to you, better? The reason I chose the term better is because better is a relative term. Depending on why you raise sheep or goats, that's going to determine what's better to you. I'm a commercial producer, and so my best sheep are my most productive sheep, the ones that have triplets, the ones that produce a lot of milk where the lambs grow well. Those are my best sheep. I grew up showing sheep, and I know some of the folks on here have children that show or they themselves show, and that animal may not be the same as what works for me in the commercial world. Or if you're a dairy goat producer, you know, you're looking at, you could be looking at different things. If you just have a few animals because you enjoy them, um, there's still aspects of genetics that are important, but better is going to mean something perhaps different to a lot of different people. So, so that's kind of what I mean by better sheep and goats. And I'm going to try real hard for it not to matter whether you're into meat or fiber or um, show or dairy, whether you have 20 sheep or whether you have 500. Um, you know, a lot of these topics still are relevant to you. The only thing I will say is genetics does become more powerful the more animals you have. It goes without saying that in terms of making genetic improvement, the more animals you have, the more power you have, the more powerful, the more change that you can make. And of course, we'll talk about that as we get into some of the some of the other topics. Genetics itself is a very very young science, only about a hundred years old. It's also a very complicated science. I don't think it'll be that hard for you to stump me on a question related to genetics. I struggled putting the presentation this one together in the sense that genetics can be very complicated, but how can we make it? I'm not saying simple, simple, but but make it so we only really talk about the aspects that we need to to kind of go on to the next step and understand things like breeding system selection, performance evaluation, and things like that. You know, what is it at this basic level that we need to understand to be able to go on uh, to the next step? So what we're going to talk about first, basically, is terminology. And again, the very basics, the uh, the Jurassic Park talk, if you remember when that movie came out and they explained how they made a baby dinosaur from the DNA. So we're going to talk about the DNA, the chromosomes, the genes, and the alleles, and there's a lot of other different terms and probably a lot uh, more complicated things, but, you know, what do we need to talk about, again, to get us to the to the practical side of, of breeding sheep and goats and making genetic improvements in them. So we start with DNA. That is the correct listserv address. The other one was a um, not an address to send an email to, it was a web page that tells you how to describe, subscribe to the different listservs. I'm just not sure I got it exactly right. So we start with DNA. That's basically our, gen our genetics. That's how, what determines how we look, how an animal performs. And of course, we're all familiar with that double helix um, of what the DNA looks like. RNA looks very similar. And DNA is organized into chromosomes. And of course, chromosomes, they're found in, every, in the nucleus, so the nucleus of the cell, in every cell of the body. And there's basically two kinds of chromosomes, autosomes and sex chromosomes, two kinds. And of course, it's important to understand that different species have different, may have different numbers of chromosomes. Sheep have 54 chromosomes, 27 pairs. <laughs> 
Goats have 60, and that's 30 pairs. People have 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. Because sheep and goats have a different number of chromosomes, they, don't, they can't intermate. Has it ever happened? They can make a, basically a hybrid of a sheep and goat in a laboratory. It's called a chimera. They did report a number of years ago in the scientific literature a hybrid between a sheep and a goat. It had an intermediate number of chromosomes. So it did happen once. Um, it's kind of an interesting story. They, it was in Botswana in Africa, and they nicknamed the ram or the, or the male the rapist because he would relentlessly pursue females of both species and they eventually ended up castrating him. But he actually did have an intermediate number of chromosomes. But essentially the two species will not intermate because they, have, they are different organisms with different numbers of chromosomes. People always tease me because I raise hair sheep and sometimes some hair sheep resemble goats a little bit. But no, hair sheep are a sheep and they have 54 chromosomes just like sheep. They are the same species as wool sheep. In fact, there's some interesting things about genetics that some of you may not know as we relate wool sheep to hair sheep from a genetic standpoint. Okay. All right, so there's two types of chromosomes, the autosomes. Basically, out of those 54 chromosomes, those 27 pairs, 26 of them were autosomes. So all but one pair of chromosomes are autosomes. And these are, the, these are the chromosomes that pretty much control most of the traits. And they pretty much control them the same way in a male or the female. There are some exceptions. But for the most part, they control features the same in a male or female. So that last set of chromosomes in every organism is the sex chromosomes. And in most, and we, and in most animals, well, there's two, most animals that have two sexes, there are actually animal organisms that are hermaphrodites that only have one sex. Some of our worm species are only one, are hermaphrodites. Liver flukes, tapeworms, they don't have X's and Y's. So we use the letters X and Y to differentiate uh, the sex chromosomes in most animals. Females have two of the same kind, so XX, and males have two distinct chromosomes, the X and the Y. So females are XX and males are XY. So what that means, contrary to often what some people think, the sex of the offspring is determined by the male. Because the female only has one to give, an X. So she gives every offspring an X. So the only way we're going to get a male is if the male contributes a Y. If he contributes an X, we're going to be XX and be female. If he contributes a Y, we're going to be XY, and we're going to be a male. So anytime somebody says, you know, gets mad at their wife because they had all girls or something like that, it's not because of the wife's genetics, it's because of the male's genetics. I guess his little Y sperms didn't swim fast enough. The one thing I forgot to mention, if you look at the two, the chromosomes, the Y chromosome is really, really small. So it looks very different than the X chromosome. It's very small. Okay. But the bottom line is, from a genetic standpoint, the male determines the sex of the offspring. Female determines the number of offspring, or the upper potential by the number of eggs she calculates. Now, is this pure? Actually, it's not, because... A number of studies, particularly those done with wild animals, um, shows that diet may have an influence on the sex ratio. Not so much an individual offspring, but looking at it kind of in a population, that you will get more of one gender or the other uh, based on diet. Because essentially all organisms physiologically start out as females, and so a number of things have to happen for it to become male. But genetically, the male determines the sex of the offspring. So don't be blaming the girls. <laughs>
Okay, and a unit of inheritance composed of a single segment of DNA is the gene. This is kind of the, the gene is like the atom is to the world. The gene is the basic kind of building block, the, the, the basic thing. They're also in pairs, um, and they encode for an amino acid sequence of a protein. Proteins are made up of amino acids, and they encode for them. The physical location on the DNA is called a locus, or plural, it's called a loci. So that's what genes are. Another term is alleles, and they're kind of the alternate form of the gene, one of part of the pair, located on a specific place on the chromosome. And this is where we use, usually use letters to denote them, uh, capital letters, <coughs> excuse me, and lowercase letters to denote genes. And so an organism is going to have two alleles for each trait. Or, in the case of a lot of traits, they're going to be affected by many different uh, alleles. But certain ones, only one. Then we have the situation where if there's two alleles for each trait, what happens if they're the same? When they're the same, that's called homozygous. They're the same. When they're different, they're called heterozygous. And these terms are important for understanding, again, some of the basic concepts of genetics. You'll, you'll, re, you'll see these terms a lot. Well, so-and-so is homozygous for this trait. Inbreeding increases homozygosity. You know, it increases the number of genes that are the same. That's basically what inbreeding does. Basically, crossbreeding does the opposite. It kind of mixes up so you get more different kinds of genes. Both of them have their pros and cons. And then we have what we call dominant or recessive alleles. Again, we use letters to denote the genes or the alleles. Dominant we usually indicate with a capital letter. Recessive we denote with a lowercase letter. And when it's dominant, just like the word sounds, it dominates the recessive allele. It masks the expression of that other allele that's recessive. So the only way we're going to get that trait is if there's two recessive genes. And this um, square you see right here in the graphic is basically what we call a Punnett square. And it's used to predict the likely uh, outcome of, of a certain breeding for, a, for a, in this case, just an individual trait. So in this case, we're talking about uh, basically fleece color. The inheritance of the genetics of fleece color, pattern, things like that is very complicated. But in a lot of breeds, there is one gene that kind of turns color on and off. Okay? White is dominant. Black is recessive. Breeds like, say, Dorset, Rambouillet, Romney. Very simple for color, white versus black. So in this case, we're breeding an animal, a white animal, that's heterozygous for color. So they're, what they look like is they're white, but they carry a recessive gene for color, for black. So we use this Punnett square to tell us of the different possibilities of mating. And essentially what it says is out of, out of uh, these four possible combinations, 25% of the time we're likely to get a black lamb. We're likely to get a recessive, recessive trait because the lamb inherits both a recessive gene from both of its heterozygous parents. So that's just, that's, that's how we use, we can use this again to predict a lot of different traits. We can use it for more complex traits, but it gets a, a little bit harder to, to look at. But this tells you very simply, you know, the inheritance of a very simple and kind of the difference between dominant and recessive. And again, we'll use these terms a lot. We've got, we've got traits that are dominant, we've got traits that are recessive, and, and, and some of them are pretty darn important, and we're going to talk about some of those. First thing here, what are some dominant traits in sheep and goats? Where that, again, where the, the dominant alleles override the recessive allele when there's a heterozygous state. So the only time we see this trait, recessive trait, would be in that 25% of the time when it's a double recessive. 
So traits that are dominant in sheep and goats. And I'm not sure if some of you realize some of these. For example, it is a hair coat that is dominant in sheep, not a wool coat. And if you go back to thousands and thousands of years ago, sheep were hair sheep. They were, they had a short, they had hair coats, they had short tails, they had horns, and they were brown. They had a combination of like a short undercoat, a soft undercoat, like a down, and a guard hair. And when man started selecting, he selected for that down, and that's how we got wool sheep. But the dominant trait is to have a hair coat. Within hair sheep themselves, and, and I guess I didn't realize this for a long time, is that red or tan color is what's dominant in hair sheep. Most hair sheep, at least the katahns, which are very popular, are white. Most of them, not all of them. There's a lot of colored ones. But it's actually the, the white or, or the red or tan that, that's the dominant trait. As I already mentioned, in most breeds, a white coat is dominant. Now, there's some exceptions. Obviously, the Black Welsh Mountain, black is dominant. The Caracal, it is dominant. The Jacob, it is dominant. The Dorper, it is dominant. Genetically, a Dorper is a black sheep with a big white spot. And for those of you not familiar with the breed, they basically look white, but they have a black head. But genetically, black is dominant, which again is different than most of the breeds. For the most part, white is dominant in goats. Perfect example is a Sonnen. The When you get color, it's a double recessive, and they've named that breed the Sable. I think the only difference between a Sable and a Sonnen is, is the color. I don't think anything else. So basically, white is dominant in the goat. Those of you familiar with boar goats, the traditional markings of a boar goat, kind of the red head and the red kind of fronted, that's the dominant trait. Red is dominant over black. Pulled is dominant in both sheep and goats. It's a dominant trait. Brown eyes are dominant. Wattles in goats are dominant. Okay, so these are dominant traits. So let's take the flip side. What's recessive? So again, the only way we're going to get, get these traits is we're going to pair up two recessive genes. So if I breed two heterozygous zygotes, I'm only going to have 25% of the time to get a, these animals. Again, the woolly fleece is a recessive trait. I'll make sure I talk up to make sure I'm not creating any, any uh, audio problems. I'm just checking, checking the chat box. Again, the flip side of white is the colored fleece. And again, it's not all breeds, but most of our conventional breeds, colored is a recessive trait. Horns are recessive. In both species, horns are recessive. Inheritance, things are a little bit different between sheep and goats, and we'll talk about that, because horns, horns are a trait that's often discussed in genetic classes. The blue eyes are recessive. Myotonia, which is basically the two goats in this picture are what we often call the Tennessee fainting goat or the myotonic goat. They, they don't faint, but they kind of stiffen uh, when they're frightened. Their muscles stiffen. Well, that's, for the most part, that's a recessive trait. Once we start breeding to other breeds, for the most part, that, that, that defect goes away. So it's a recessive trait. The other thing that's common with these, these goats besides the muscle stiffening is they have a very good meat to bone ratio. And when we cross, you kind of lose that as well. Uh, again, color in goats is more recessive. The black boars are more recessive. And then we've got different, some different genetic defects that are the result of inheriting a recessive gene from each parent. The classic one for, in the sheep industry is the spider lamb disease or syndrome. Uh, when that first hit the sheep industry, that was a huge deal. And um, not only in the Suffolk breed where it started, but in kind of in any breed that did any crossing with them. And we actually saw it in a lot of different breeds. Uh, it didn't take a real long time before animal breeders realized that it was a simple inheritance, a simple recessive gene. Cryptorchidism, which is basically when the testicles fail to descend down into the scrotal sac, 
is believed to be a simple recessive trait. Uh, entropian, which is an inverted eyelid, uh, is believed to be a recessive trait, although I recently read a paper that talks about maybe there being some environmental effects or it maybe not being as simple as a simple recessive trait. Somebody asked a question about what is a spider lamb. A spider lamb is an extreme structural defect. They call it spider because their legs kind of splayed out and typically it, it's a very really a lethal gene because they don't, some of them will live for a certain period of time but they really don't live to reproduce and so um, that's where the term came from. They believe it was the result of uh, or exposed because of the selection for extreme frame size in Suffolk sheep. You might almost think of it as the opposite of dwarfism, um, which is another trait, uh, particularly in cattle, that was caused by a, is a recessive trait. And then things aren't quite as simple as recessive and dominant. We get things that kind of get foggy or blurry in the middle. Sometimes the dominant allele doesn't totally dominate. It only partially dominates. The classic example of that is in sheep, and it's scurs. I don't know how well you can see the picture of this ram, but he's got very tiny horns. Or tiny, they're not fully developed horns. They're kind of underdeveloped horns, and we call them scurs. And you get that in the heterozygous state. So the, if you had two dominant alleles, you would have a polled animal. Two recessive alleles, you'd have a horned animal. And then the heterozygous, you'd have the scurs. There is also, I think, an example in, in cattle in color, and Jeff might know, know about this, but I think there's an example where hair color instead of, hair color is sometimes intermediate in color. I know it, there's one in flowers, too, where the heterozygote is not, say, white or, pink, white or red, but it's pink. It's someplace in the middle, and I think, yeah, that's true with one of the cattle. Pold is dominant in goats and sheep. And then what effect does gender or sex have on inheritance? Well, there's kind of three different ways that it can influence uh, genetics in the, in the animals. First, the trait could be sex-linked. In other words, it would be on, actually be on the X or Y chromosome. I couldn't come up with a trait in sheep and goats that was sex-linked. So the only example I could give is in people, hemophilia, which is carried by the X chromosome. Uh, also, I think color blindness is as well, but I, I don't know of any in, in sheep and goats. And then what we might call sex limited, which basically only one sex expresses that trait. Of course, milk production would, would be an example. And then we have what we call sex influence traits, where not only the genetics determine the expression of the trait, but the sex of the animal, specifically the hormones. Again, an example of that would be horns in most breeds of sheep. Perfect example. Um, actually, I was going to say it's a perfect example. These are, ram, these are rambolets. These must be typically a, a rambolet. The female is polled and the ram is horned. In some breeds, including the dorset, both sexes are horned. But if they cross the horned dorset with, an, with a polled breed, um, it, will, it will be affected by the sex. Beards and goats is, is probably another example because you won't, you won't typically see a beard in a female goat. You won't typically see a mane in a female sheep. Hair sheep sometimes have manes. So the gender of the animal interacts with the genetics to determine the expression of that trait. Somebody makes a mentioned something about a buck producing milk. I actually saw a, a, a buck secrete milk myself. So anytime when we say things, sometimes we find exceptions. Epistasis is simply one the expression of one gene is dependent on the expression of one or more other genes. And the classic example of this is color, fleece color, 
skin color, coat color. You know, for anyone who thinks that fleece color is simple, yes, that black versus white in a lot of breeds is simple inheritance, but a lot of our natural color breeds, a lot of our different goat breeds that are lots of different colors, a lot of our face color things, it is a lot more complicated. There, there are genes that kind of turn on color. There's genes that are spotting genes that are, you know, and epistasis is a classic, is classic in the inheritance of fleece color. And there's some really good stuff that's been written for some of the specific breeds if this is something that interests you. I know they've written a lot with Icelandics, Shetlands, Wensleydales, a lot of our natural color sheep. There's a lot of stuff written about their fleeces or the inheritance. And even some pretty decent stuff written about goats. Okay, what about genetic linkages or kind of co-inherited inheritance? This is when traits kind of are inherited together because the genes are associated. The classic example of this in the sheep and goat world is polled goats, polledness in goats. Again, polledness is recessive, is, a, is the dominant trait, okay? But what what we have found out is that if you breed a polled goat to a polled goat, you increase the incidences of hermaphrodism, or basically intersex, in the homozygous female. Basically, she has the organs of both genders. And, and it has been proven in science that this has occurred, but it's like a lot of things in genetics. It's not every single one of them. It increases the probability. It increases the probability. And it's simple to it's simple to deal with. Just don't you know, just make sure male or one of the goats is horned. You know, one is horned and one doesn't mean you have to get rid of a pulled doe. I'd probably want to use the, a horned buck. Doesn't mean he has to keep his horns if you don't like horns, but genetically he should I you know, you want one of them to be horned. Why take your chance? Why take your chance? Okay, the next thing is genetic correlations and responses. And this is kind of the extent to which I select for this trait. Does it, does it have an influence on a second trait? Both from a genetic standpoint, are they genetically correlated? And then sometimes it's not just a genetic correlation, but it's kind of an environmental influence, a, a correlated response. I mentioned that in grad school, my thesis looked at the selection of reproductive rate in Rambouillet sheep. We also looked at the, we call it, my thesis was called the direct and correlated responses to selection for reproductive rate. So we looked at the direct things we were selecting for, which was ovulation rate, embryo survival, looking at those reproductive things. But as we sought to improve the reproductive rate of these range ewes, did it have any effect on the growth rate of the lambs, the growth of the wool, the quality of the wool? And basically my thesis said, no, it did not. And, and a lot of research is done to make sure that when we select for one thing, we don't get a result that we don't want. We usually express correlations uh, between negative one and one. If it's zero, there's no correlation. If, it's, <clears throat> if the correlations are close to one, they're not very strong. The closer they get to minus one or plus one, they're pretty strong. So what are some positive correlations? And again, these would be between 0 and 1, some of them more closer to 1 or over 0.5. Can't hear me when we switch slides. Oh, well, I'm, I won't talk while I switch. I'll take a break. Okay, here's some, some of these are, are, pretty, ob, are well, pretty obvious. Birth weight is highly correlated to weaning weight. Within reason, bigger lambs, bigger kids grow faster. Weaning weight is highly correlated to post-weaning weight. Lambs that grow well to weaning usually grow well post-weaning. Those that grow well post-weaning tend to make, have heavier yearling weights. Bigger ribeyes, we tend to get a higher percentage of retail cuts in the carcass because it's a big measure of muscling. The ex number zero, oh, I'm sorry, the positive correlations would be above one. They'd be positive, as high as one. So one would be perfectly correlated and then zero would kind of be the base where we start at. So if a trait was <clears throat> 0.7, that would be a pretty positively correlated trait. If it was 0.1, it probably wouldn't be very high. 
And when they calculate genetic correlations, they try just to get at the genetic effects on it. Some things, you know, genetics and environment get very foggy, and we'll talk about that, but so we try our hardest to separate those things. A few of these other things, ovulation rate, litter size, uh, we calculate at our research center the correlation between fecal A count and FAMACHA scores. We get a positive correlation, but it's not a very strong one. Scrotal circumference is related to a lot of things, uh, semen production in the male, but also puberty and ovulation rate in the female. One of the advantages of correlations is sometimes it's, if two traits are correlated, one trait's easy to measure and the other one's not, and we can select for that correlated trait. Perfect example would be ribeye area. Um, if we can if ultrasound and actual ultrasounded ribeye and actual ribeye that we measure on the carcass are very highly correlated, but it's a whole lot easier to measure ultrasound. So sometimes we can use these correlations to select for a trait that's more easily measured. On the negative side, what I mean by these numbers in it, if it was negative one, it'd be completely negatively correlated and then up to the maximum of zero. So again, if it was a minus 0.1, that's not very negatively correlated. And by negative correlations, <clears throat> and even to a degree with some positive correlations, sometimes it's the actual direction of the numbers, but sometimes I think I can think of positive and negative as, is it adverse? For example, birth weight. Heavier birth weights usually have an adverse negative effect on lambing ease. Bigger lambs, harder to deliver. Bigger kids, harder to deliver. As we select for fleece weight, and particularly if I talk about commercial white wool, we're going to get an increase typically in fiber diameter unless we simultaneously select for both. Well, that's not good in commercial white wool. We want more wool, but we want it finer because in the commercial white wool market, we're going to get more money for fine wool. Same thing with staple length. If I just select for staple length and don't pay attention to fiber diameter, again, I'm going to get coarser wool, which in the commercial market is going to be less desirable. Uh, as, as I get higher ovulation rate, as I get a female to ovulate more eggs, I'm going to lose more babies. That kind of goes without saying. And that's probably not just genetic, that's probably environmental too. Getting back to parasites, uh, in this case, the numbers go in opposite directions. A, high, a low fecal egg count goes together with a high pack cell volume. Even though the numbers go in opposite directions, it's actually a positive correlation because I want low egg counts and high pack cell volumes. So I don't know if it was proper to separate them as negative and positive because, it, like I said, sometimes it's the direction of the number and sometimes as well is it positive or is it negative. Something else that's real important is when there aren't correlations. And a lot of studies have looked at this. One of the most recent it, pack cell volume is a measure of red, red blood cells. The barber pole worm, which is the dominant parasite, affecting sheep and goats sucks blood. It causes them to be anemic. We can measure that by doing a blood hematocrit or a pack cell volume. We estimate that with the FAMACHA score. That's what pack cell volume is. We want that to be high, those numbers, 25, 26, 27, 32. We want them to be high. Fecal A count, we want to be as low as possible. A lot of people are selecting on scrapie genotype. In sheep, and we're learning in goats as well, we know that certain genotypes are resistant to scrapie. But if I select those genotypes, is it going to have any effect on production, on wool production, milk production, uh, just productivity in general? And basically the research says no, it's not going to have an effect. We've tried to see if resistance to this disease is related to resistance to this disease. There was some discussion about sheep that are resistant to foot rot were also res more likely to be resistant to parasites, but really none of that research has panned out. A lot of people think, well, gosh, if I select for reproductive rate to get more twins, I'm going to get lambs that don't grow as well. I'm going to get poor quality carcasses. And again, the research does not support that. You can select for reproductive rate. It is not going to have a negative effect on growth or carcass traits. It's not going to have an effect on wool traits. Horn condition, versus, and, and are, are horned animals or polled animals more productive? Really, they're, they're not correlated. Same thing with color. Color may be important to you because, well, maybe I can sell a black boar for more money than a red boar, but it doesn't make it a better goat. It doesn't make it a better goat from a genetic standpoint. The other thing that I have learned over the years is, and even in doing more recent reading, is that these genetic correlations, whether they're uh, genetic or, or some environmental influences, 
they tend to be all over the board. Uh, they very much vary by breed and very much vary by study. I've seen studies that have shown that parasite resistance and fecal A count and parasite resilience, pack cell volume, FAMACHA scores are negatively are adverse, adverse to each other. In other words, sheep that shed fewer eggs don't necessarily need deworm less often. You know, that goes opposite of, of other stuff. So a lot of stuff depends on breed and depends on study. A lot of, increasingly we're calculating genetic type data, you know, specific to breed. Your neighbor says that black lambs are more aggressive than white rams. If they're the same breed, there's, they're, there's, then no. And you got to keep in mind, when we do genetic studies, we can't do it on two rams. We have to have numbers. We have to be able to look at populations, and that's the important thing about genetics. It's like, you know, if you, if you, have, a, you have two or three of a whole bunch of different breeds, you really can't evaluate those breeds. We need populations to be able to make genetic evaluations to see if the differences are genetic versus environmental. Okay, I want to briefly talk about genetic defects because... For a small flock that can't really make a lot of genetic improvement, because making genetic improvement requires culling animals, requires selection, requires having differences in animals. Again, it favors the bigger flocks. But a lot of these, these genetic defects can come into play no matter how many animals that you have. And there's a few, again, that, that are very simple in terms of how they're inherited. Again, I get back to that spider lamb syndrome. You can see a picture of what a young lamb would look like. You see how his, both his front and back legs splay out. The cryptorchidism, which is the, which is the testicles failing to descend. The myotonia, which is the stiffening of the goats, the myopathy. Uh, there's a hairy lamb syndrome, particularly recently found, in, I know, in the Southdown breed. I believe that's a simple inheritance. I put poldness in goats because, um, because of its relationship to the intersex condition in, in the female as being, these being relatively simple. A lot of other stuff's a lot more complicated. Question about folded ears. I suspect folded ears fit in, in category number two more complicated. Yes, they have genetic effect. You know, everybody tells you you have a sheep or goat with an overbite or an underbite, you should get rid of them or get rid of the parents. Yes, it is genetically transmitted, but it's not simple recessive uh, idea. Again, I, I've read there's a recent study looking at the uh, inverted eyelids saying that it's not as simple as, as what we affect. <clears throat> In my own flock, I deal with an incidence of scrotal hernias. I've had more than, I, uh, more than just one and um, when I read as much as I can about them, and most of it's on pigs, it sounds like it's a combination of genetics, but not simple recessive inheritance, but also environmental. Teeth defects are probably multiple, again, multiple genes, not that simple. Structural defects, you know, the animal's cow hocked. It's down on its pasterns. Yes, they're gen genetically transmitted, but it's not a simple inheritance. It's more complicated. Same thing with fleece defects. Uh, prolapses. Um, both have genetic components, but I know specifically that uh, rectal prolapses, for example, were considered to be about 10% heritable. Well, that means 90% is due to the environment. And then within that 10% heritability, it's not a single gene. So again, it's a little bit more complicated. So when you have the, these problems, if you're able to call animals with these problems, you're going to work yourself out of them. And again, the more animals you have, the more flexibility you have in culling animals that have some of these different kinds of problems. Uh, when a baby's born with something weird, you know, it's, it's um, I had a lamb born without a rectum. You know, obviously it's a birth defect, it's a congenital defect. You know, what the genetic role in it, I don't have a clue. You know, what environmental effects might have contributed, again, I don't have a clue on some of these things. A lot of things have genetic components, but they're a lot more complicated than we would like to think. There's only a couple of them, a few of them that are pretty simple. Kind of moving into the uh, home stretch here, uh, just basically talking about what we're interested in, which is how does, how do we, how do we influence the genetics of that next generation? And of course it starts very at the very beginning with the sperm and the egg and each has a chromosome from its parent which chromosome it has 
is completely chance. We don't know. You know, it's completely chance which of those sperm is going to penetrate that egg. That's chance. And then so what genetics that sperm and that egg have in them is completely chance. So when I breed a ewe and a ram or a buck and a doe, there are 134,217,728 possible combinations of those chromosomes. 2 to the 27th power. In other words, even just breeding that male and the female can result in considerable variation. Genetics is about chance. It's about probabilities. And using those tools to try to make genetic improvement. And if I could teach one thing about genetics, it would simply be understanding the difference between genotype and phenotype. What is the difference between these two? And I find that even the most experienced shepherd gets them confused. Genotype is the genetics. The genetic makeup of the cell. Remember, every cell has the DNA and the nucleus of every cell, every organism, every animal. Those genetics determine your potential, the, the hereditary potential and the limitations of the individual. You could have a lamb or a kid that's got tremendous potential, genetic potential for growth, but he's always got worms or you don't feed him enough. So it sends the potential and the limitations. And then conversely, you could, you could keep them as healthy as can be and, and perfectly balanced rations and they still might not grow fast because it also sets the limitations. So the, the basis is the genetics. The phenotype is what we see every day. It's what the animal looks like. It's how the animal performs. It's what we can see. It's what we can measure. Birth weight, weaning weight, that's phenotype. That is not genetics. What it looks like, how straight its back is, how pretty it is. That's phenotype. That's not genotype. That's not genetics. The phenotype is determined by genetics plus the environmental influences. And we like to forget that at times. So what do we mean by environmental influences? Diet, the biggest one of all. It amazes me how much more money somebody will pay for a well-fed animal. They are not buying a genetically superior animal. They're buying a well-fed animal. Health. Again, if it's, if it's kept healthy, it has the opportunity to express its genetics. Weather. How they're raised. Age. How they're born. You know, a triplet is at a disadvantage to a twin. Uh, a baby whose mama is one is at a disadvantage to a baby whose mama is four. How they're housed. When they're born. All these different factors determine the phenotype of that animal, not just his genetics. So I ask you, which buck is better in this picture? Somebody answer me in the chat box, which buck is better? Two boar bucks, which one's better? You, you're right, you're absolutely right. It depends. There is absolutely no way to tell. You are looking at phenotype. Well, maybe I question needed to be more specific. Which buck is better genetically? Okay, because you can make a statement of which one looks better to you or, or whatever. But which buck is better genetically? And you absolutely cannot tell. You cannot tell. Um, because, again, you're looking at phenotype. And um, actually, these two bucks are different ages. Uh, they're obviously, they were fed differently. You know, we don't know anything about their background. So the more of the story is just understanding that to actually sell which is a genetically superior buck, we cannot tell. We need more. We need more. Yes, they're both very handsome. Moors are very handsome goats. Okay, last thing. And that's just to talk about the two different kind of traits that there are. And if you're wondering what that handsome ram is, I can't pronounce it in French, but it's called Red of the West. <laughs>
and it's about the heaviest muscle sheep I have ever seen. This was from an AI stud in which the sheep were performance and progeny tested. That was a place all about genetics. Okay, two types of traits, qualitative and quantitative, or what we also call polygenic. Two traits. Okay, the qualitative are the traits that fall into kind of simple categories. Blue eyes, red eyes, I mean not red eyes, blue eyes, brown eyes. They're usually affected by one gene or maybe just a couple of genes. The environment has very little influence on them. The environment's not going to affect what color eye you have, I guess unless you have contacts, but that's not what your eyes are. So very little influence in the environment. Conversely, the quantitative or polygenic traits are continuous in expression. You know, the kid weighed 4 pounds, 6 pounds, 8 pounds, 10 pounds. Not that he had blue eyes or brown eyes. There's considerable variation in the phenotype. Again, it, it's a continuum. Typically under the influence of many genes and much, much more environmental influence. Much, much more. Qualitative traits, things like blood type, eye color, coat type, fleece color, horns, wattles, beards. Again, some of those inherited defects that we talked about that were uh, simply inherited from recessive genes. You know, you either have inverted eyelid or not. You either got a spider lamb or you're not. Your testicles are either in your scrotum or they're in your body. Or one's, one's one place. They're very distinct, discrete categories. Very simply inherited. You know, the environment has no effect on wattles. It has no effect on the beard. The quantitative traits. Reproductive rate, growth rate, milk production, fiber, carcass, disease resistance. One gaining more popularity. Confirmation. Even your show ring traits what you want the animal to look like in the show ring. They are not qualitative traits. They are quantitative traits. They are affected by many different genes and they have and they, and they have a great deal of genetic variation. Wool shedding, whether it's a hair or wool coat, is simply inherited, but the degree of shedding is a quantitative trait. Feed efficiency, all of these traits are determined by many genes, great deal of variation, great deal of influence in the environment. And guess what? These are the ones that are usually of the most importance to us. Of course, the harder ones, the ones that have a great deal of genetic variation. It's why we're trying to find where things are on the genome. It's why we're trying to develop, you know, use technologies that can help us, you know, kind of get to the fact that these are multi multiple, uh, multiple genes that affect them. On occasion, we'll find major genes that affect some of these traits. There's a breed of sheep where one gene, or several breeds of sheep where one gene affects the number of babies. This is a ewe that had quads. The genes that affected the number of babies she had was many. In, an, in these other couple of breeds, they have found a major gene. So there are some examples of major genes, but for the most part, we're looking at these quantitative traits that are affected by many different genes. And of course, ultimately, what we want to get towards is improving genetics. Not to, you can improve phenotype. You can have a better year, better weather. You can feed better. You can have better hay. You can be a better manager. You can keep more lambs alive. And you should always try to do that. But you're not, making, you're not making better livestock. Genetically, you're not making better livestock. There's only a couple of ways that we do that. One is by crossbreeding. And in next week's presentation on breeding systems, crossbreeding is going to be included in part of that discussion. The third presentation we'll have will be on selection. Okay? So basically, you have two ways. You mix the breeds, and hopefully you do it in an intelligent way. Or you select, you determine who gets to be parents, you determine who to call. That's the other way. Fourth presentation that we're going to have, still on the idea of selection, what kind of tools can we use to help us select in terms of uh, keeping records on the farm? The fifth one is kind of going to be, I'm going to say in a little bit of ways it's futuristic. What are the things, more sophisticated selection methods that we can do? Now, EPDs are one of them, and we're going to talk about that in the fifth session. Maybe not as sophisticated as whole genome mapping and all that sort of thing, but still a, a pretty sophisticated way of making genetic improvement compared to what the majority of producers do. So that's what we'll cover as we go throughout this session. So next webinar will be a week from today, 7 o'clock, Eastern Standard Time, Breeding Systems, and Jeff, who's in our chat box, and he just gave a really long answer, is going to um, be giving that presentation, and I will be answering things in the chat box. So the purpose of tonight was just kind of to get us started, you know, talk about the basics and, and the different types of traits and the different types of inheritance in preparation for, well, now how can we make genetically superior animals? And, and again, the most important thing is understanding the difference between 
genetics and environment, or genotype and phenotype. It's not that phenotype isn't important, because obviously if you're a good producer, you know, you keep your animals healthy, you feed balanced rations, you're going to get the potential out of those genetics. But you want to keep improving everything genetically. They're looking at more and more different kinds of uh, traits in terms to determine their genetic um, components. One of the things I'm going to say where they're looking at mothering ability, and I've seen some work in Australia and also at the uh, Spooner Research Station in Wisconsin, is looking at lamb survival, of which mothering ability is a component of that, looking for the genetics of that. And typically what we find, I can honestly tell you on a lot of these things, is they typically find, yeah, there's a genetic component, but it's pretty darn small. Now, on the other hand, reproductive rate is pretty darn small. It's only about 10% heritable, meaning 90% is due to the environment, our management, things like that. Only 10% is genetic. But, but my thesis, my graduate work, told me that you clearly showed the, the progress that you'll make by selecting for reproductive rate. So even something like mothering ability, while the number might be relatively small, over time you will make progress. And if it's an important trait to you, I know it is to me. I mean, I want three lambs, so I want good mothering ability. So, and if I was lambing on pasture, it would be even more important. Uh, somebody asked a question, okay, is wool diameter a simple genetic trait? It, it's, it's a quantitative trait controlled by many genes. Yes, if, I mean, so when you breed a finer sheep to a coarser sheep, some of those offspring will be finer. You'll still have a great deal of variability in it.